Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, sorry that we couldn't meet uh, yesterday on the 22nd, uh, but I wanted to go ahead and continue a little bit of what we were doing uh, here in the prolegomena section before we get to the primary text of Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. And where we had ended up is we had basically gotten through uh, the Renaissance and the Reformations in Europe and saw that whereas there had been a kind of uh, homogeneity and a even a kind of unity in Europe after the decline of the Roman Empire with the advent of feudalism and the spread of Christianity and also uh, a sort of Christian ec ecclesiological uh, hierarchy throughout Europe that the the Renaissance the return to really learning and reading and also reading in not just uh, vernacular languages, but of course in Greek and Latin, is one of the instrumental causes of not just literacy, but also the Reformation, because people become, uh, the Protestants are very much uh, of the mind that literacy and their religion are connected. We want to know the Protestants will often, whether they be Lutherans or Calvinists or Anabaptists, we are going to interpret the Bible for ourselves. Now, they're going to have various creedal and confessional systems whereby they do that, but we're going to read the Bible for ourselves. The, the, its meaning is not going to be imposed upon us from a magisterium or from some other uh, for, foreign entity is, is the view, but we are going to determine it ourselves. We're going to determ determine the meaning of biblical texts and then some of the other corollaries from this is, are, are that, you know, if there are illegitimate structures in place, such as the papacy, such as Catholic kingdoms, then those are in violation of uh, the, r the real divine order that can be deduced from looking at biblical texts, and those need to be supplanted. And so therefore, a lot of the Protestantism ends up being very disruptive to the former uh, uh, homogeneity uh, that had existed that had existed previously so it ends up being disruptive and there are some you know some uh, fire ups and cool downs what you see in the 17th century are a host of religious wars whether it be the British civil wars uh, between England unto itself and of course I in Ireland and in Scotland you see the French wars of religion where Cardinals Richelieu and Mazarin do everything they can and are pretty successful in routing out uh, Protestantism. Uh, and even the Bourbon dynasty was originally a Calvinist dynasty that converts to Catholicism as a kind of... Uh, uh, to kind of ease tensions between the Protestants and Catholics, hence his, um, the, I think it's Henry IV of France, the Edict of Nantes, uh, that ends up kind of making things peaceful, but then that Bourbon dynasty later on ends up becoming decidedly Catholic and quite injurious to Protestants. And then, then of course, you have the Dreisigjarige Krieg, or the Thirty Years' War, going on in Germany. So that all that, and all those I'm, that I just mentioned, 17th century, and that's going on in the background, that's sort of the political situation. But then, what I want to do is I want to transition from talking about the that the the um, the Renaissance and the Reformations because there's another step in Europe uh, in its intellectual history that is known as the Enlightenment and I want to see how we get there so we've spent some, a lot of time in this prolegomena thus far talking about the the political backdrop what I want to do now is talk about sort of the intellectual backdrop that's not it's not reducible to the political and I'm going to talk about two specific philosophical traditions that come into play significantly in this time and so these philosophical traditions are developing concomitantly with those political traditions so I'm the first thinker I'm going to talk about is Rene Descartes for example and he was a French soldier in the Thirty Years War in Germany in fact while in the Netherlands he met, uh, he meets Isaac Beekman, a mathematician, uh, during that time, during that war. So this is when he's living. Or someone like uh, John Locke that we're going to talk about in the uh, empiricist British tradition, uh, going to be very much uh, involved 
at least um, in terms of theory, with the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Uh, but I'm not going to focus really on their politics too much, per se. There are some things here that have uh, consequences in politics. But I want to take a look at these two traditions, the uh, Continental Rationalists and the British Empiricists. And uh, I want to do a bit of an overview of what they're getting at, because Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud are very much going to refer back to a lot of these ideas. And this is... And they're going to coalesce, these trajectories are going to coalesce more or less in Kant, and we need to get to Immanuel Kant. And so that's what I want to spend our next class doing, is actually talking about Kant and the Enlightenment, the, Auf uh, the Aufklärung, but I want to get there first. So here's the trajectory that I want to talk about. Uh, and this, uh, these slides that I have in this video, I'll probably put up on Blackboard in themselves as well. So first of all, there's considered in philosophy, two main traditions in 17th and 18th century philosophy. The continental rationalists, called continental because most of them are from the continent of Europe, and the British empiricists, uh, who are British in the sense that they're from the British Isles, uh, and they're empiricists. And at this point in time, there's a certain sense in which you could say, you know, Plato was a rationalist, and Aristotle was an empiricist, and I think that's fine. But following that medieval understanding of the world, and I don't mean medieval in a diminutive way. Some people will say, in fact, in the 19th century, people like, uh, uh, a little late 18th century, 19th century, people like uh, Voltaire and Diderot, French philosophes, will in coin phrases like the Dark Ages to go back and, and talk and describe the medieval world and how apparently impotent it was intellectually, and they'll do that to kind of make fun of it, and that's where those phrases come from. But as I've indicated before, uh, the medieval era is intellectually robust, but what it does have is an antiquated framework. Now, antiquated, I don't mean in the sense of outdated, but in the sense of merely old, so maybe I should say an antique framework. But many thinkers are, are think that the Aristotelian way of looking at the world is antiquated. It's already failed us in cosmology. Because here at this time, in the 1600s now, 17th century, it's established that, you know, c the conclusions and observations of Copernicus and Galileo, they're on point. Therefore, the way that Aristotle described the world is mistaken. And if Aristotle is wrong in cosmology, and as Luther says, Aristotle is wrong in ethics, perhaps we should remove the way in which Aristotle has affected pretty much the entire way in which things are thought of. It, sci medieval science, whether it be in the Islamic world with Ibn Rashid or Ibn Sina uh, or Al-Farabi, very much Aristotelian. Okay? Uh, under Aristotelian assumptions about epistemology, what is, uh, the knowledge of something is its, its matter, its efficiency, its form, and it's telos, uh, the four causes of Aristotle. Uh, y you one needs to know the potentiality and actuality of substances in order to have knowledge. Uh, and really, n what knowledge is, is the knowledge of substances. And what are substances? Various modes of being. But Aristotle, while he was very much the progenitor of science, if you look at Aristotle's scientific method, most of it is merely speculative uh, from a, a certain metaphysical assumptions. And it doesn't really involve any investigation, especially when it comes to the big stuff. Now, Aristotle very much um, wha observed animals and plant life and, and was very, very detailed. But obviously, there's certain uh, he couldn't really perform an, uh, or do any kind of experimental science uh, as we would understand it today. But so what starts to happen in this time, too, is we also start to get what's called the scientific revolution. I think that notion is a gross oversimplification, so I do want to say that outright. I, I don't want to focus on that too much. But what I do want to focus on is that this time, people are simply saying that the way that Aristotle did things was insufficient to get at the new kinds. Obviously, he was mistaken about cosmology. Maybe he's mistaken about other things, too. And one of the primary figures who does this wi with very Catholic intentions is René Descartes, uh, a Frenchman raised by Jesuits. And one of his uh, 
motivations in writing his philosophy is to basically produce for the Catholic Church a new systematic philosophy that can replace the old Aristotelianism and the old Thomism. Uh, as it turns out, Descartes' books end up getting banned, but his intentions were fully to produce a new Catholic philosophy, a new first philosophy starting at the beginning. And in fact, that's what, what he's trying to do. So what does Descartes do? Now, there's some things in here that I do have that are, that, and this is, these are the slides I use for my intro classes that I don't want to focus on. Uh, like he invented the uh, co Cartesian coordinate system, x, y axes, as we know it. The thing that I want to focus on is what Descartes says about metaphysics or, or reality and consciousness, because this will come into play, uh, obviously, in Kant. All of this is going to culminate in Kant. And then, really, much of what Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud are going to be doing are going to be responses to Kant, sometimes by way of Hegel and other Kantian successors. So, Back in Ar Aristotle's scheme, simply there are different substances, okay? Different, con and what substances are are basically combinations of matter and form. So there's the substance, you know, trees are made out of wood. That's the material cause of trees, but the substance of a tree or an, uh, is its very, its particular combination of matter and form. Descartes rejects this. And he wants to think. He wants to try and think about the notion of substance, race in Latin, R E S, in a completely different way. And so he starts from this assumption. Descartes does. There have to be two substances. Now, w whether we agree with it or not, this is his uh, proposition. And he does this a bit in discourse on the method, and he does this a bit in meditations, and kind of goes back and forth between the two. He says there are two substances. There is basically extended substance, that which is measurable, that which can be quantified, uh, and so that would include uh, really anything physical. So if you can if you can get out a ruler and measure it in terms of three dimensions, okay, length, width, height, but not merely that. If you can weigh something, if it's something quantifiable. That would be extended substance. Sometimes this is called body or... So, for example, there's a famous expression from this time. All bodies are extended. If something is physical, it must be extended. That is, you can measure it in some way. It's quantifiable. And again, in Latin, that's res extensa, or in French, uh, chose attendu. That's extended substance. Now, that's one of the substances. It's one of the things that the universe is made out of. It's not merely made out of, you know, uh, uh, like earth, air, wind... Uh, I'm sorry, earth, air, fire, water, like the classic elements. It's made out of, this is one of the substances, extension. And then there's another substance, he says, that is, that which is immeasurable. That which can, you can't measure it. You can't, it doesn't take up physical space. Well, you might say then, well, why posit it or postulate that it's a substance? Well, Descartes, in Descartes' mind, there has to be a, a way in which matter is influenced. Now, so bodies are extended, they just sit there, but how is it that my, th what substance is it that's causing the bodies to move? Now, for Aristotle, it was the noehi ho nous, it was thought thinking thought, it was uh, basically Aristotle's notion of the divine God is what's making everything go in motion, and that's how everything works. Uh, Descartes doesn't want to accept that, because that ends up being another postulate. Uh, it's more things that we have to to. to to think about, and he wants to—he wants this to be as simple as possible, even though this ends up being dualistic. And uh, there has to be this other substance that can influence matter. All right, that's like so. It's my mind that's telling my arm to move right now. Okay, there has to be some non-physical stuff that causes the physical stuff to be in motion. Now, there's going to be a later thinker that I know you've heard of, Isaac Newton, who much of what Isaac Newton does is 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 making a career to disprove anything Descartes said. And I'm saying that kind of jokingly, but it's also kind of true. So we're, we're pre-Newtonian physics here. But never, Descartes, nevertheless, is saying there has to be these two substances, a non-physical a non substance, which you can call it soul, you can call it spirit, you can call it... They're going to use... Uh, he's going to use the expression race cargatons in uh, Latin and une chose qui pense in French. And you, you just... Uh, you can call it soul or spirit, but he doesn't mean just like an like immortal soul, just non-physical stuff. Um, 
a non-physical substance. Now, he spends a lot of time trying to figure out how these two substances are able to relate to one another because the, the extended substance, like say of your own body, extended substance can affect your mind. You can feel, you feel pain, perhaps in a certain sense, I in the location of the body. But even according to modern cognitive science, that pain, while it's, it's, it's as though it's being experienced in a particular lo location in the body, it's really in the brain. Now, Descartes knows about brains, but he doesn't have this, he would say mind instead of brain. Really, the pain is in the mind rather than in the particular spot where the pain seems as though it's being experienced. And so Descartes struggles with how do these two things relate? How, how is it that the mind is able to tell bodies what to do? Where is the nexus of their interrelation? Because if someone could move objects with their mind uh, outside their body, we call that magic or sorcery. But how is it the case that we're able to do it within the domain of our own body? Is it some additional kind of magic? Now it turns out Descartes says in the pineal gland, that's where the nexus is. I, to this day, I still can't figure out exactly why he says that, but that's what he says. It's the pineal gland where there's a nexus between these two substances. But he posits these two substances, but seems to have a problem saying that, uh, explaining how they relate. But he says there's two substances, and this is called sometimes substance dualism, metaphysical dualism. Now, the next thing er, that I want to mention is Baruch or Benedictus uh, Spinoza who is a figure who has a great admiration for Descartes, but uh, wants to remedy what he sees as some of the defects in Descartes. Uh, and certainly not in a hostile way. He doesn't think like, oh, Descartes was an idiot, and he said all these things, and he was wrong. He does think Descartes was wrong on some things, but he really seems like he's spending a lot of time what he's doing trying to remedy Descartes. And the main thing that he wants to remedy in Descartes is the notion that there are two substances. Because he thinks, well, this presents a problem for you, Descartes, when you posit these two substances, and as we've already indicated, uh, Descartes has a, a virtually impossible task of saying how these substances relate to one another. He can't figure out, like, well, how is one influencing the other? So what Spinoza says instead is, there's not two substances, there's only one substance, and it's called the universe. There's just the universe and various kinds of things that we what might classically call substances such as extension bodies and non-physical stuff it exists uh, if it exists uh, these are not uh, substances these are attributes of the one substance and so Spinoza says that there is one substance, and you can call it, he, sa he uses the la Latin expression, Deus sive uh, natura. Let's see, I've got, I'm sure I've got that somewhere. Here we go. Deus sive natura, uh, which means God or nature. You can, and this is the sense in which Albert Einstein, the 19th and 20th century thinker, used God or the universe in interchangeably for people that say that, like, oh, Einstein believed in God. Well, he believes in God in the Spinozian or Spinozist sense, that the universe is God and God is the universe. You can call the universe God in terms of there being a, an orderliness uh, out there, but if this is not a, a personal being of some kind or a deity. It's just the totality of the universe. There are no created substances. There's not, and, and in the Christian tradition, and really, and also in Islam and Judaism, there's kind of a hard distinction between the creature, okay, there are created things, creation, and the creator, God. They're separate substances. Now, sometimes you, there are, uh, there's Neoplatonism and certain kinds of mysticism that say, like, oh, there's a spark of divinity within us, or something like that. But e there, even, uh, the universe ends up being derived from the creator. There's still a, a bit of a distinction. Here, Spinoza is saying there is one set of things that are, and that thing is, that, that's that one substance. And so he's a monist in this sense. There's only one substance. It's the universe. It's the, you know, now there's n the non-physical stuff in it too. So the physical and the non-physical, uh, those are attributes of the universe. They're, they're not substances, as Descartes had said, they are attributes of the universe. And there, the universe actually might even have infinite attributes, but the two that we certainly are aware of are the thought Okay, non-physical substance. And that's all that's meant by thought here. It doesn't mean thought in the sense of like a thought in your head. 
but thought as in the sense of non-physical substance, or in, in Spinoza's case, non-physical attributes, non-physical stuff and physical stuff. There's stuff that's solid and stuff that's not solid, and both those things are part of the universe. Okay, so you might even in include, there's a possibility we might even include like something like energy in this category. Granted, we're before uh, the law of, conser or, or knowledge of the law of conservation. Uh, mass, like, obviously, EM equals MC squared is going to come later, but it comes from a, a few uh, Spinozian presuppositions, I suppose. So this is, this is um, Spinoza's construal of the universe. Now, why this is, why, again, I want to stress that these are the rationalist thinkers, and they're doing this based on a kind of, it's still a speculative analysis. There has to be, the, the way in which we conceive the world is important. This is the way our minds function. So notice the function here is on uh, looking at the way that the universe functions by kind of thinking and conceptualizing it. Uh, even if this seems a bit speculative, we'll see how the empiricists, I think, are a bit, are a bit different. But here's what I, I at least want you to know this, because um, Freud's also going to reference Spinoza. Nietzsche's going to reference Spinoza. Uh, and Marx is going to reference Spinoza as well, all for different reasons, and, and Descartes too. Uh, our next thinker I want to address is Leibniz. And what Leibniz is doing is he is taking the rationalist notion to its extreme. Now, one, one thing to go back to Descartes a little bit when he says, when Descartes is saying that there are two substances, a question becomes this, and this is important, and I don't want to bring it up, I didn't want to bring it up until Leibniz. The question becomes, well, what am I as a human being? Like, what am I? Am I? non-material substance or am I material substance? And this is where Descartes in Discourse on the Method section 4 ends up saying, well, let me doubt, let, I'm going to go ahead, and he does this in Meditations 1 and 2 as well, I'm going to doubt everything. If I doubt everything, what's the one thing I can't doubt? That I'm doubting. So therefore, what am I, and if I'm doubting, I'm thinking, and then he makes the conclusion in, in Latin, cogito ergo sum, or in French, je pense donc je suis, what is that? I think, therefore I am. Now, and what that means, I, I see that sometimes on, I guess, coffee mugs and things. What I think, I th therefore I am, means is my existence is predicated on my thinking. Which means for Descartes, my existence, my human existence is predicated not on my body. The body is sort of just like an extra. What I am is my consciousness and I am my mind. My body is, sure, it may be important, I can say this is my body, but really what makes me a me is not my body, but my mind. We might say in later terms, my consciousness. So that's who I am. Uh, that's why we can say even in like science fiction, if two people, if two different people, like they swapped minds, well now just because you're in a different body doesn't mean you're not you anymore, you still have your own mind. It's whoever, whatever, whatever the mind is, that's where the identity is. Or if you've ever been to a funeral where someone has like an open casket, and you, you can say like that's, that's their body, but that's not the person, that's not them. Okay, but the, f the focus was my identity is primarily mind. What I am is primarily a non-physical substance. Where is the soul? How much does it weigh? How much space does it take up? It's not that those questions are ridiculous, it's that they, they don't even apply to the situation. Okay, the soul, the mind, is a non-physical thing, therefore it is not subject to measurement. Okay, which is why the medieval question, uh, if, like, for example, if angels are non-physical beings, and you ask the question, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, the answer is both zero and infinity in a certain sense. They're not physical beings, so they don't, they can take on a physical appearance, perhaps, or maybe they can transubstantiate into physical substance, but angels in themselves, um, uh, not physical beings, so how, how much space do non-physical beings require? Ends up being a ridiculous question. Further, that question is probably something else invented by the 19th century, 18th century philo philosophers because it doesn't appear in any medieval literature that I've seen. But what does Leibniz do? Leibniz takes what Descartes said, kind of goes back to Spinoza, and he, he met with Spinoza a few times uh, in the Netherlands, but he goes back to Descartes. Descartes said that I'm a thinking thing. Well, what if... and Spinoza says there's really one universe, and Leibniz says everything in the universe is made up of thought. So he says the universe primarily is thinking substance, and by that he means non-physical stuff. The universe is primarily non-physical. And you might look around in things and go, mm, that looks pretty physical to me. 
But what Leibniz is saying is that on a fundamental level, here's his hypothesis, and this is called the monadology, and there might be some ways with regard to atomic and quantum theory that Leibniz might even be correct, depending on how you think about it. But he says, hey, take any physical object, okay? Yeah, it's physical. What physical means is that it's quantifiable or measurable. It takes up space, x, y, z axes. It takes up weight, all right? So even like the air in the room, it doesn't seem like it's solid, but, because it's not, it's, it's gas, but it is adding weight and pressure to the room. It, it's, it can still be measured, even if it doesn't seem like it's physical. That we don't mean merely solidity. But if I take Leibniz would say any physical object, I've got this pen in my hand, who those of you listening to the audio can't see, but I have a pen in my hand. Consider this, you could divide it in half, all right? Now I've got like a half size of it. Okay, so I've got this now, and then I can divide that, and I can divide that, and I can divide that, and I can keep making pieces smaller, all right? You can keep cutting things in half, and keep cutting things in half, and keep cutting things in half. And when you get to a point where you have, where you can't cut it in half anymore, where it's indivisible, well, if you can't cut it in half, and it not, not due to some sort of physical limitation, but you can't cut it because there's nothing to cut, well, then that means the fundamental nature of physical, su physical stuff is itself immeasurable and unextended and non-physical. Because if you get to a point where it, you can't measure it, if you can zoom in so far that you can't zoom in anymore, again, not because of some limitation in ourselves, because there's nothing there to go to, then the universe must be primarily non-physical and made up literally of mind. Mind, again, in the sense of non-physicality. And he doesn't mean mind in the sense of like, uh, like Deepak Chopra, just consciousness floating out there. Uh, that, is, that, that is a philosophical theory, like panpsychism is a thing uh, that we, we can talk about, but not here. Now, th that's Leibniz's philosophical view. He also has some problems with Isaac Newton, who's his contemporary. Uh, actually, Isaac Newton dies before him. He thinks about writing an insult letter to Isaac Newton, and, I and Isaac Newton dies, and he says, never mind. Uh, you can see that in his collected works. So this is the rational tradition. As you see, you go from th there are two substances to there's one substance to in Leibniz. And literally, there's all these little almost bits of thinking substance. The universe is just a collection of these non-physical bits. He calls them monads. Okay, but the point is that the thought, the non-physical stuff is primary. And this is what, th these are the scientific, or I should say metaphysical theories propounded by these three. Now, in contradistinction to this, we have another tradition of British empiricism. And in British empiricism, uh, you get takes that are not this. In British empiricism, over, generally speaking, the idea is, let's, one, let's quit positing the notion that non-physical substance is what's essential. Or even the notion of really substance in that way. What we know is not really out there. Pretty much all that we know is that what our senses tell us. What we can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch those are that that is that which is confirmable anything beyond that like oh there must be monads out there uh, no those can't really be confirmed through empirical research because they're metaphysical now that's not to say that we can't like zoom in with like a microscope or a telescope it's uh, it's what we can see here smell taste touch and then augment so we c we can use tools that help us to augment our sensory capacity but really knowledge comes to us not through uh, speculative cog uh, cognition, but through empirical sensation. Now, there will be some differences here in the empiricist, so let's take a look at that. So the first empiricist is John Locke. He's very well known, obviously, in the uh, political realm for saying, you know, you know we're tabula rasa um, and, you know, life, liberty, property, all that stuff, which is predicated on his views on metaphysics and epistemology. But I'm not going to focus on th that here. What I am going to focus on is what he has to say about the acquisition of knowledge. So what he says is, as I already indicated, uh, he does say that we are, uh, human, be human minds are tabula rasa. We're not born with any knowledge. Uh, as, say, someone like John Calvin had said, we all have the innate knowledge of the divine within us. That's called the connaissance de Dieu, or the senses de winitatis in John, in John Calvin, or something like Plato. We have all, we have access to the world of forms, or even Thomas Aquinas. We have access to the agent, uh, or the passive intellect, and our agent intellect intellect goes in conjunction with that to determine what substances are out there. Nope, all that Plato, Aristotle, throw it out. Okay, we are blank slates. That's what tabula rasa means. We're blank slates when we come into the world. 
And that's why he ends up saying, ultimately, humans are equal, because we all come into the world with just as much intellectual content. Uh, namely, zero, because we're blank slates. Uh, and there are no innate ideas. And so how do we acquire ideas? And ideas are constructs, he does say, in the mind. And so you might think, well, that kind of sounds like rationalism, using the mind. Sure. But the focus is on where the concepts, or what he would call ideas, come from. And he says ideas come to us via two ways. One, through the immediate sensory apparatus. He calls this sensation. So, like, you see something. Like, you, you look at something and you go, I see it. There it is. That's sensation. Or you, you can hear something, smell it, taste it, touch it. That's sensation. It comes to you immediately through your sensory apparatus. And then there's uh, knowledge comes to us through reflection. And reflection is not where we're using immediate sensation, but we're using the capacity of the imagination uh, and I don't mean imagination here in the sense that you might think of an elementary school, like use your imagination, draw a dragon or a unicorn, but imagination in the sense of your imaginative faculty, that you can close your eyes and think of something. So sensation, reflection. Sensation, I have the experience of, a look. I'm looking at the bookshelf right now. Uh, reflection, if I close my eyes, I can kind of remember the bookshelf, but I'm only reflecting on what I've already experienced. And so reflections can only come from what we've already thought about. And so knowledge ideas come to us through sensation and reflection and not through any other means then Locke makes a distinction between qualities in our ideas so they come to us via sensation and reflection basically it's either happening right now or you remember it but then he can he says we can make primary and secondary distinctions in objects primary qualities in an object are in the object itself itself you know how how much space does it take up? How big is it? Those are things. That's those qualities are there regardless of the presence of an observer, such as myself. So if this um, if this pen is about six inches long, if I leave the room, the pen is still six inches long. That's not that's not going to change. However, there are also subjective experiences, which he calls secondary qualities, that Locke says they're in the object that are in the object. So, for example, something like how this pen tastes. If I were to lick it, <laughs> ugh, if it, if that, the experience of the taste, that's not a primary quality that's in it. It's the secondary quality that's in my experience. Now, he would also add something like color. Like, this happens to be a black pen. Now, he doesn't have the same theory of optics that we would have now, but if I leave the room, sure, the photons are still reflecting off it in the same manner, but no one is, if there's no one else in here to see it, no one's visually having the experience of the color black. All right? It might be that. but So Locke says there's primary qualities and secondary qualities. And you might find that an unsatisfactory ans answer by saying, well, it's still black, right? It's still a black pen, or if you have a red pen or a blue pen, it's still that color even when you leave the room, even if nobody's seeing it. Which I guess begs the question, what is color in the first place? Is it an experience or is it, is it an occurrence? Um, and I have the different kinds of knowledge here, and that's not really important for our purposes here. But I want to go on to our next thinker, George Berkeley. I know it looks like Berkeley, and Berkeley University is named after him, but it's George Berkeley. Okay? Irishman, whereas Locke was English. So he doesn't like what Locke just said, especially that he, sure, the sensation and reflection he thinks is great. The problem that he has with Locke is the distinction he made between primary and secondary qualities. He, he ends up saying, what are, what are the qualities that are in the object that are not that are in it, but don't really rely on your perception. He ends up saying, really, what objects are, are ideas in the mind. Since things are coming to you through an empirical experience, really, what's going on in our experience is nothing but the ideas in our own minds. Okay, and this is called subjective ideal idealism, which is basically, there's no primary qualities. There's no, like, this, this pen is not just taking up so much space in and of itself out there in the universe. All I've got are my own experiences about the universe. Um, and f this is true for everyone. So for us, like we might think like we have a knowledge of an out there, but we really don't have a knowledge of anything out there. We only have a knowledge of a in here. Okay, I only know what the wor world looks like through my eyes, through my ears, through my nose, through my sensation, my sensations of taste and touch. That's it. I don't have, I can't, I've never had an experience outside myself and I can't. And so therefore, there are no primary qualities out there. There are only subjective 
secondary qualities. And of course, if that sounds, especially for uh, he's a he's a Anglican minister, a bit upsetting. He says, "Well, listen, God is the ultimate perceiver. He is." He is the one cognizing all of us through his sensory apparatus, so it's okay. Uh, the catchphrase for this uh, view is often essay est percipi, which means to be is to be perceived. So something only exists because it's being perceived. So you could say on this view, you know, if a tree falls down in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make any sound? And Barclay's answer to this question would be, listen, if a tree falls down in the forest and no one's there, not only is there no sound, there's no tree and no forest. Things only exist when they're being perceived. So for example, I'm in this room right now. If you're watching the video, you can see it. All that exists, at least for me right now, <laughs> is this office and that bit of the hallway, wherever you are right now. If I'm not perceiving it, it doesn't exist for me. Now, if you're a perceiver there, it, it exists. And maybe we can, we can uh, communicate with each other. But even then, really, if I, if I were to like Skype you right now or talk to you on the phone, I hear your voice. No, you're there. I'm only having that experience of you on a screen or in this room. Okay, so we've, again, we've only had subjective experiences. Consider um, this, for example, that you've never seen your own face. You might think, yes, I have. I can look in a mirror. No, no, no. Well, then you're not looking at your face. You're looking at a reflection of your face. You're like, oh, I can look at pictures where my face isn't backwards. But even pictures or you see yourself in a video... You're not looking at yourself, you're looking at a representation of yourself on a screen or on a photograph or something like that. There's, you've only had your, really your own subjective experience of yourself even. Something to consider at this point, okay? Um, now, that's not exactly uh, Barclay's focus here. His, his focus is simply that there's only, really there's only subjective experience and thank God we have his subjective experience Ma making sure that everything in the universe is functionally functioning effectively. Uh, that brings us to our final thinker in this series, which is uh, David Hume. And so David Hume is, if I could say Leibniz b is the most radical of the, uh, of the continental rationalists, I would say David Hume is the most radical of the British empiricists, him, he being Scottish, by the way. Uh, so David Hume. First of all, he has pretty much problems with what everybody I've mentioned today has set up to this point, whether it be Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, or even uh, Locke and Berkeley. He thinks that really there are, pro there are problems with each of them. Now, what he says ultimately is, look, if, if Berkeley's right, and they're really only subjective experiences, then that means one really that all the really all the rationalists are wrong. There there is no mind. Really, all we are as human beings, he says, we're bundles of perceptions. We're really just sets of experiences. That's all I or you am, or you are, I should say. That's all we are. Or we're we're just basically collections, bundles of experiences, sensory experiences. That's it. That's all we are. A set of perceptions. Um. And from these perceptions, we, th we end up thinking that we often conclude things about reality for which we're mistaken. So he has problems with things like cause and effect. We think something, oh, look, I just knocked on the table and it made a sound, okay? The, my knocking caused the sound. To which he would say, well, the only reason why we ever make any kind of connections between a cause and an effect is simply out of habit. Uh, simply because our senses have always s seen one thing and then another thing happens, we end up making these cause and effect connections. But uh, Hume says there's there's really no causality there to see. Cause and effect is in effect an illusion of sorts. It's just an association we make. Uh, just like I'm sure you've heard in the social sciences, correlation does not equal causation, uh, or post hoc ergo propter hoc, the fallacy. What Hume is saying here is yeah, we that every instance where you think there's causality, really one thing happens and another thing happens. Okay, and Hume even says at one point, this is ridiculous, it's like saying, you know, like the rooster crows in the morning, and then the sun comes up, so the rooster must have caused the sun to come up. Now, most of us probably don't have roosters crowing to wake us up in the morning, but imagine thinking that your alarm clock is what makes the sun come up in the morning. That would be ridiculous. And it's ridiculous because you can't say just one thing happened, then another thing happened, there must be a relation between the two, but he's saying that's what we do with cause and effect. And if science is the study of cause and effects, it's a 
really a misbegotten endeavor at getting at truth. Um, also, induction is a problem. So induction is where we take a couple of instances and then we extrapolate a generalization from those experiences. Now, the more data points that you have, the better your extrapolation is going to be in terms of probability and likelihood. So like if you poll people, who are you going to vote for in the next election? And you ask one person and they say, oh, I'm going to vote for the Democrat. And then you go, 100% of those polled say that they're going to vote for the Democrat in the next election. Well, true, but that's not really indicative of really any accurate sample because you talk to one person or even 10 people. Um, the, the more instances that you have, the better that it gets. But all it takes uh, when you say, like, this is going to happen, we even saw this, I think, to some degree happen in uh, the last presidential election. But it, all it takes is one counterexample to disprove any generalization as a rule. So imagine that you see you've never observed a duck before and you're a, you're a, you're a new you're a duck scientist okay um and you're observing uh ducks and you see a duck and you say oh, this duck is white and then in your research you've concluded you've every duck you've ever encountered every other human being has encountered is white and so you reach the conclusion all ducks are white and that's it that's it all ducks are white but then you find a black duck well, now, you, even if you find a billion, trillion, gazillion white ducks, all it takes is one non-white duck to invalidate the, the conclusion as a rule. It still means, well, most ducks are white. You can still say that, but to say all, this is the case. But this is what we often do with science, okay? When we make various formulae, say the formula for gravity, uh, the mass of one object plus the mass of another object, uh, over the distance between them. Newton's formula for gravity. It, does it work all the time? No. No, it doesn't. And, and in fact, that's what uh, scientists like Einstein and Eddington uh, were figuring out in the early 20th century, is that Newton's gravitational theory works for the most part, but then when you have high gravity, it doesn't work anymore. That's why the, the, the orbit of Mercury doesn't make any sense. That's also how... Um, I can't remember, honestly, if it was the planet Uranus or Neptune, how that was discovered by accounting for the fact that Newton's gravitational theory was mistaken. It was either Uranus or Neptune. I can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, Hume says these problems of induction cause and effect. Basically, we just have all we've got are experiences. We don't know anything about truth. We don't know anything about reality itself. All we, all we know are those secondary subjective experiences. That's it. There's We have no knowledge of anything beyond that. So... Uh, let me be clear here that um, Hume is not saying that therefore since science doesn't really get at truth we shouldn't do it um, on the contrary he does think that science is an important endeavor uh, at explaining phenomena our everyday experience but he doesn't think it has anything to do with capital T truth that's not a thing because all we have is are our subjective experiences which is why he says and I'm actually I should have gotten this out earlier I'm going to pull and read from the very end of his inquiry concerning human understanding where he says this, um, and I, I can't remember if I have this up here. I, no, I, I don't. So I really should put this up on the screen, but I'm just going to read this uh, to you, and I'll probably put this up on Blackboard as well just so you have. This is the very end of his inquiry concerning human understanding. He says, um, very last paragraph of the book, so this is a very, very, very little tiny bit here. He says this. When we run over libraries persuaded of these principles uh, that everything that he said about, you know, we're just bundles of perception, what havoc was, must we make? He says, if we take in our hand any volume, so a book about that purports to be about something of divinity or school metaphysics, all right, that's scholasticism, stuff like Thomas Aquinas. For instance, he says, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? Okay. Is this book about something non-measurable? Okay, does it mention spirits or souls or things that we don't experience through our senses? He says, we ask that question, no. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning um, matter of fact or existence? No. Does it, and if, if you find that it, it doesn't talk about something that's quantitative, and it doesn't talk about something that involves experimentation or experimental reasoning, that, that is something that we actually experience. And the answer to that question is no. So those are the two questions. Does it involve the quantifiable? No. Does it involve uh, experimental reasoning? 
concerning matters of fact and existence? And the answer to that second question is also no. He says this, commit it then to the flames. So if you're reading a book, now he's not saying throw away, set all your books on fire. But what he is saying is, if you're, talk, if you're looking at a book that purports to be about knowledge or truth or reality, and it doesn't involve the quantifiable, and it doesn't involve experimental reasoning, then set it on fire, all right? Because, it's, because he says this, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. It doesn't get at knowledge. It doesn't get at truth. Now, I don't think he's actually telling people, again, to set their libraries on fire, but to say, don't expect things that appeal to the unquantifiable and the, the unconfirmable or the unverifiable to be about anything real because they're not they don't get at anything true true because the, all the truth we've got is that uh, is that of our own experiences perhaps we can even doubt those do we do we have false memories or something like that now that's going to come up later but hume says all, all i know is what i've experienced that's it that's all i've got i don't have anything outside that i can't even be in others experiences that's why sometimes even uh, you know, have you ever been in a situation where people were at the same function? Maybe people are at a birthday party and they remember something very differently. They might remember different events. They might uh, remember the events having a different tone. This happens all the time. And so it seems like maybe even our own recollections are not reliable. Where Hume says, at least I know all I've got are my experiences. That's it. That ends up being problematic. So where that leaves us and where I want to turn to for next time is this. I've talked about these two traditions and so and Hume dies in 1776 that year is easy to remember for some reason um, he dies in 1776 and at this, at this time there's another thinker uh, in, in Germany who at this point is uh, pretty young but there is a German thinker, and his name is Immanuel Kant. He is going to read David Hume, I want to say in about the late 1770s, early 1780s is when he reads him. And he was actually a follower, uh, Kant was originally a follower of Leibniz. He was a student of Christian Wolff, who was a basically a professor on Leibniz, who was fired for saying things that might not uh, be congenial to the re religious establishment at the time, even the Protestant establishment in Preussen or Prussia where he lived. But Kant reads Hume and thinks to himself, if this all this stuff is true, that science doesn't get at truth, and all we have is our own subjective experiences, then all the stuff that Leibniz, Descartes, all, none of that matters. It's all just made up nonsense. Hume's right. We should, cons we should commit everything to the flames pretty much. How can anything be real? How can anything be? How can anything matter? How can science purport to get at truth? How can there be really any truth of any kind? Not just capital T truth. How can there be lower T truth? How do I know that I'm actually here right now? How do I know, like Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. I know that I exist. How do I know that? How do I know this isn't later? How do I know this isn't a simulation? And so Immanuel Kant makes a career out of coming, trying to reconcile the conclusions of the rationalists with the conclusion of the um, the conclusions of the empiricists, and I think he does a successful job of this. Okay, um, and he's going to have this reconciliation, the synthesis is going to have a huge effect on the thinkers that are going to follow. So the thinkers that uh, the thinkers that are going to follow that I'm going to focus on are people like uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Hegel, um, Ludwig Feuerbach, uh, who for a time is a is a Hegelian too. Um, who else I want to focus on, maybe a little bit of Friedrich Schleiermacher as well. So G German thinkers um, that are important. The main two that I'm going to focus on are Hegel and Feuerbach. Um, <coughs> excuse me, definitely. And uh, I want to focus on what they do. And so because they're kind of taking Kant, uh, maybe oh, no, another one I'll think of, Ar Arthur Schopenhauer. We'll be talking about Schopenhauer as well. So Schopenhauer, Feuerbach, um, uh <laughs> Schopenhauer, Feuerbach, Hegel, and maybe a little Schleiermacher, uh, talking about how they deal with w with Kant's reconciliation and synthesis of these ideas. Now, I don't want to actually spend too much time on what Kant says, so I'm probably going to spend uh, next class on it. So here's here's your assignment here on out, those of you listening and watching. The assignment is this: on Blackboard right now, 
if you go and let's let's go there if we go here's here's your class if you go to um not course content but if you go to assignments you'll see a folder there that says supplemental readings first of all the slides that i've been using so far uh, actually these are some slides i'm going to use but the slides i've been using so far i'm going to put up here as well in this folder but also here there is a piece by Immanuel Kant out of a volume on practical philosophy called uh, What is Enlightenment? Was heißt Aufklärung? Um, where Kant tries to describe the historical moment in which he finds himself and we find ourselves. Uh, it's a bit bombastic and, and frankly I think a, bit, a little bit especially for Kant, a bit arrogant. But what I want to do next time is talk about, th I'm going to talk about Kant overall, uh, his uh, critical project, and we'll talk about the uh, Critique of Pure Reason. But I'm, I'm not going to make us read from the Critique of Pure Reason. I, I, I will put a selection, I think, from the Critique of Pure Reason up here, and I'm, I want to mention what Kant is doing in class next time. But I also want to start our class on... Monday, this will be Monday the 27th, by talking about talking about Kant's project and then looking at what is enlightenment and then we'll move on to some post-Kantian thinkers. And the post-Kantian thinkers are going to be the conduit between um, the thought of Immanuel Kant and Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Because I'll say this, without Immanuel Kant, I, I really think he's kind of a historical sine qua non. Um, that is to say... To get to Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, there would have been no Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud without without Kant. I really don't think. Not that they're not that any of them, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, are huge Kant fans, especially Nietzsche. But that a lot of what they're doing is reacting to the positions of Kant and and his successors in many ways. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. <coughs> excuse me at Thomas B at USCA.edu. That's T H O M A S B at USCA.edu. And I might do a couple more of these um, throughout the semester when I think that they're necessary to, um, to uh, give us a little bit more robust content. But have a good rest of your day, everybody, and a good rest of your week. Good weekend. And I'll see you on Monday. Bye bye.